Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. Premier Jason Kenney announces new COVID restrictions as the fourth wave crashes through Alberta. This is now the only responsible choice that we have. Details on a proof of vaccination program and a renewed push to get the shot. It is now clear that we were wrong. And for that, I apologize. Face to face with the Green Party leader. Even with a small caucus in the last parliament, we always uh, punch above our weight. Annamie Paul answers questions from undecided voters and Rosie about party unity, her plan and her future. Does that mean if you don't win your seat, you, you will no longer be leader? Inflation hits an 18 year high. It's uh, a big hit to the wallet for sure. What's causing it and will Canadians see relief? Emotional testimony from U.S. Olympian Simone Biles on the sexual abuse suffered at the hands of Larry Nassar. I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. This is The National. Tonight, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney did something he once said he would never do. As the fourth COVID wave surges out of control in that province, he has announced a proof of vaccination system along with strict new measures to slow the spread of the virus. We must deal with the reality that we are facing. We cannot wish it away. Morally, ethically, and legally, the protection of life must be our paramount concern. There are new gathering limits, business restrictions, and mandatory masking for some school children. This is a huge shift in tone and approach for a premier who declared the province reopened earlier this summer. And with his announcement came an apology for how some of this COVID battle has been tackled until now. Carolyn Dunn has the details and the reaction from businesses. This is the first day this Alberta spin class chain has been requiring mandatory vaccinations. We do feel like we're ahead of the curve, although the writing was on the wall. We did feel like this was something that was going to come. He's right. With COVID cases surging, ICU and hospitalizations threatening to paralyze the province's health system, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney announced a vaccine passport. Program, a proof of vaccination program for participation in certain discretionary activities that have a higher risk of viral transmission. If they participate, that will exempt them from a long list of public health measures announced today. Vaccinated people must limit their gatherings to 10. Unvaccinated people are not permitted to gather at all. Restaurants and pubs move to outdoor service only. People will be required to work from home unless they need to be physically present. And strict capacity limits at faith services and retail. A far cry from the post-pandemic utopia Jason Kenney was predicting in June. But I believe we'll be open for good. We believed that we could prudently move away from addressing COVID as a pandemic and towards an endemic. It is now clear that we were wrong. And for that, I apologize. But Kenny remains politically vulnerable. We've had restrictions coming and going, mixed messages coming and going, defiance coming and going over the last year and a half. I, I don't see how he can recover. So, Carolyn, clearly this is a health care system already at the brink. This is an emergency. What's being done to address that? Well, the projection, Adrian, is in 10 days, Alberta will have run out of ICU beds and have run out of the staff to care for ICU patients. So Alberta Health Services is reaching out to other provinces asking if they can send COVID patients from Alberta and put them into their ICUs. And they're also asking if specialized and skilled staff can come to Alberta just to take on part of this overwhelming load we're experiencing. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn Dunn in Calgary tonight. New Brunswick's latest COVID surge pushed the province to introduce new measures there today, including a proof of vaccination program. It's important that we impact the daily routine of people that could be vaccinated and have chosen not to be. So that means proof will be required to access non-essential businesses starting next Wednesday. That comes 
as the province reported a record 63 new COVID cases today. Now today we got official confirmation that consumer costs are surging in Canada. You may have already noticed there's growing pressure on your take-home pay. Here are some of those tough details. In August, the consumer price index was up 4.1% over August of 2020. That is the biggest year-to-year -year jump since 2003. The cost of meat is up nearly 7%. And the Home Replacement Cost Index, which is related to the price of new housing, rose by 14%. It has not done that since the 1980s. All this near the end of an election campaign that is partly about affordability. We will tell you why the inflation trend is happening and how long it may last. But Jacqueline Hansen begins with a skyrocketing cost of one product many of you depend on every day. In Victoria, Ben Wood tries to avoid driving his truck these days. With gas at nearly $1.60 a liter, it costs him $150 a tank. It's uh, a big hit to the wallet for sure. He's not alone. I drive less now. I've been walking more to work. It's unbelievable how it's just going up. Gas prices plunged when the pandemic first hit, along with oil, but since then climbed higher and higher. In August, Statistics Canada says prices jumped more than 32 percent compared to last year. Unfortunately, we're not going to get much relief on the energy front for, for a while. The price of vehicles is also up as global supply chain problems persist. Higher costs at restaurants and hotels or for furniture and appliances. Those should be short lived, according to the Bank of Canada, because they're being driven partly by pent up demand as the economy reopens and Canadians spend again. That demand is, is pretty well exhausted. This economist says what he's watching in particular are wages. If those rise in a significant way, higher prices, he says, could be here to stay. That's kind of the wild card. You know, how readily can businesses pass a higher wage bill onto their customers? That could really determine uh, how much inflation on a sustained basis we see in the next one to two years. In Ontario, where some restaurants were closed longer than anywhere else in the country, some customers say they're willing to pay a little more to help get them back on their feet. I feel actually just so happy to like eat outdoors and catch up with friends and I'm like, ooh, this is kind of a priceless situation. And there's some hope that as life and the economy get back into step, prices will also return to normal. Maybe those prices will regulate back to what they were pre-pandemic. So Canadians' cash can go a little further and help more businesses make a comeback. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. All right, so let's go deeper on this with our senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. So, Peter, a lot of this sort of talk is very unnerving. For people where does it go for, from here fact is adrian we really just don't know and you have those who believe that that depends on why they think all this is happening and are we seeing inflation rise because you know interest rates are low and stimulus money is flooded into the world and then you have those wondering is this just a long-term trend or a temporary blip and that's the debate but it's important to keep an eye on the context here this chart by trevor toom at the university of calgary shows what inflation would have looked like if it had just chugged along over the past few years at its target rate of 2%. You can see it dipped well below target when the crisis began, and it's only creeping above that dotted line now. A lot of that is just bounced back from lower prices when COVID shut everything down. And, you know, Adrian, all these economic explanations, they do matter, but they're pretty cold comfort to anyone who's buying really just about anything, anything. right now. So we heard uh, Jacqueline Hansen talk about supply chain issues. Any sense of when that gets sorted out? It's going to be years. That's the hard cold truth of it. And there are two big issues within that. First is actual shipping disruptions and delays and slowdowns. But then you've got the specific issue around microchips. There's a huge global shortage. And that's the thing that's delaying auto production, for example. And you can't build a new microchip factory overnight. So it's going to take time and it's going to wreak havoc for a little while yet. Perfect. <laughs> Peter Armstrong, thanks very much. You bet. The federal party leaders have just days left to win over voters before the election on Monday. On the campaign trail today, they were pushing their messages and pushing back against distractions. Let's begin with the Conservative campaign and Hannah Thibodeau. With only days left in the campaign, Aaron O'Toole is making a push for centrist voters. We're not your dad's Conservative party anymore. But endorsing him tonight, your dad's progressive Conservative Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney. 
I am here for one single reason, to help elect Aaron O'Toole as the next Prime Minister of Canada. O'Toole says he's reshaped a more moderate party. But when asked why he continues to allow candidates who have made racist comments or those who have spread conspiracy theories about vaccines to stay, he said the candidates have apologized. I'm Ashley Burke, traveling with the Liberals. Justin Trudeau started his day in Nova Scotia, contrasting his party with the Conservatives on health care. We are spending more in the first year on eliminating the backlog than they are spending entirely over the first five years on everything from transfers to mental health to everything else. He made that announcement in a province where health care is top of mind. It played a key role in last month's provincial election, which saw the provincial Liberals go down to defeat. Trudeau is hoping to avoid the same fate. I'm Olivia Stefanovic with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh in southern Ontario, a seat-rich region where Singh is promoting his campaign promises, such as taking profit out of long-term care and urging progressives not to vote strategically. But his message is being overshadowed by the resignation of two NDP candidates over comments they made about Israel and the Holocaust. These candidates made a decision to leave. I think that was the right decision. I want to be very clear. Their, their comments were completely wrong and have no place in, in our party. The candidates were running in Toronto St. Paul's and Nova Scotia's Cumberland Colchester. The NDP wasn't expected to win either seat. Now, the Liberals have faced criticism for failing to meet their own targets when it comes to clean drinking water in First Nations. But today, one community is having its boil water advisory lifted. Shoal Lake 40 First Nation is about two hours east of Winnipeg, straddling the border between Manitoba and Ontario. And as Cameron McIntosh shows us, with today's optimism, there is, of course, recognition of how long it took to get there. Clear blue on the Canadian shield, Shoal Lake has provided Winnipeg's drinking water for a century. The cruel irony, the Shoal Lake 40 First Nation that lives on the lake's shore has been on boil water advisories for almost 25 years. And uh, the reading we got right now is 0 0.31. That's probably as good as what I'm drinking in Winnipeg. Yeah, that's probably maybe even better. <laughs> now this new $32 million water treatment plant is going online. Siobhan Green grew up with water advisories here. I'll put us in the water to give thanks. With an offering of tobacco, she prays her daughter won't. So I kind of don't know how it is to have clean water. Now this is part of a promise that was made in the 2015 campaign by the Trudeau Liberals promising to get all First Nations on long-term boil water advisories off of them by March 2021. Here in Shoal Lake, it comes late. For more than 30 other communities, it hasn't come yet. This week, the NDP made a point of it in a community waiting for upgrades. And many still do not have clean drinking water. It's also a recurring theme in debates and interviews. So. We are getting there. We've put the money, we've put the project. 1.8 billion over five years. Shoal Lake's share didn't come easy. First, the community needed a road in. There were decades of lobbying. The government ultimately financed the project. The band managed it, making sure it got built during COVID. It's un unbelievable. Also, it's about that time. Testing for the chlorine residual. Building these plants is one thing. Millions more are being pledged for maintenance and training. People like plant operator Anthony Green, now responsible for the health of his community. Oh man, I'm kind of shaking right now. <laughs> the government says several other projects are near completion, but is no longer holding itself to a firm date. Shoal Lake, now a clear example of how complex simply turning on a tap can be. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Shoal Lake 40, First Nation. Simone Biles, another U.S. gymnast, today called out the FBI and others for investigative failures in the Larry Nassar case. Nassar is the U.S. gymnastic team doctor convicted of sexual abuse. Kitty Simpson shows us the gymnast's powerful testimony. If you'd raise your right hand. They are survivors determined not to let history repeat itself, sharing their deeply painful trauma with lawmakers in the pursuit of accountability. To be clear, I blame Larry Nasser, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. 
Simone Biles and three of her teammates used today's hearing to demand the FBI face consequences for its mishandling of sexual abuse allegations against the team's former doctor, Larry Nasser. An independent report found agents waited months before doing anything about the claims, allowing Nasser to abuse dozens of additional victims. It was like serving innocent children up to a pedophile on a silver platter. They're also demanding independent investigations of the U.S. Olympic Committee and USA Gymnastics, which they say failed to protect them. I'm deeply and, and profoundly sorry to each and every one of you. Today marked the first time lawmakers were able to question the head of the FBI on what went so very wrong. Christopher Wray was not in charge at the time and had few answers. On no planet is what happened in this case acceptable. Senators now want to see legal action pursued against the agents involved. But the Department of Justice refused to participate in today's hearing, which the victims found insulting. The message that they are sending that abuse doesn't matter. There's been no public explanation as to why no charges have been laid. Survivors and lawmakers may have to wait until October for answers. That's when the Attorney General is expected to appear before the same committee. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. In India, the long-running fight between farmers and the government is heating up. Hundreds of thousands of farmers have been protesting since last fall. And as Salima Shivji tells us, they are still determined to make their voices heard. The makeshift tents stretch for kilometers on end. This sprawling camp set up in protest nearly 10 months ago is fully entrenched. Here, the rhythm of life continues for hundreds of India's farmers. Their mere presence, a sign of defiance. Protesting full time against the country's new farming laws, they say will ruin livelihoods and crush small farms. That's just fine by Mahender Chungar, 90 years old and living in a small tent with nine others. This is my life now, he says. I'll give everything until we win this fight to repeal the laws. The movement is now bolstered by a recent sit-in in India's Haryana state. The farmers livid that a previous protest turned violent. They rallied and got what they wanted, a promised investigation into what happened. Delvinder Singh was at the sit-in and calls it a key victory. We got justice, he says. It comes as the farmers are again mobilizing, fully rejecting the argument from India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi that the laws are needed to modernize the industry. That farmers will be better off. And so signs of a political showdown are crystallizing after the largest farmer rally yet in a crucial spot, Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state, largely agricultural, where an election takes place early next year. At the protest site, it's all this organizing group can talk about as they plot next steps. We see that the BJP, Modi's party, is running scared, she says, and we will campaign against them. With five months until that state election, some say time is on the farmers' side. For the first time, farmers will be a major factor and a major pressure group in the elections in Uttar Pradesh. A sign of the farmers' potential political heft. Even in the midst of a pandemic, these protests are very much a thorn in the Modi government's side. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. And now it's over to Rosie with a special television event we are bringing you this week on The National. Anime Paul is going face to face with undecided voters. We're bringing them together virtually as we do so they can put their questions directly to the Green Party leader. Where do we draw the line between our safety and our freedom and rights? I think that the climate crisis is the most important issue to me. What comes across is that there's a lack of unity with the Green Party. Does that mean if you don't win your seat, you, you will no longer be leader? Face to face with Anime Paul, that's next on The National. Hello and welcome to our final night of Face to Face with the federal leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton, again here in the National Studio 
in Toronto. And this week, as you know, we've asked each of the leaders of the major national federal parties to come here, to sit down. And then, as we do, we give you some of the time, voters. So you can try and get some answers that, that you think you might need before you hit the polls. We've got our virtual audience watching live from home. They're going to comment as we go and, and also pay close attention. Look how eager they are. And we've got four undecided voters here to put their questions to um, one of the leaders. I'll jump in for clarity or, or for more specifics if needed. Tonight, though, it is, as, as it has been throughout this week, um, all about Canadians and trying to get information for voters. Our final night is Green Party leader Annamie Paul joining us. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you making the time. Oh, it's wonderful to be here with you and the audience. So good to see you. <laughs> um, and we asked of each, of our, each of our voters to do a quick video to introduce themselves to you and to all of us. Let's meet the first one. Hi, my name is Abby Williams and I live in Mississauga. I migrated to Canada over 20 years ago. I'm a wife and a mother to six beautiful children. I love health, wellness, and food. I like eating more than I like cooking, <laughs> which is so funny because I'm an author. I, um, I write vegan cookbooks. So um, I am an undecided voter because there's, there's been issues, concerns, and things like that that has come up in the past year or so. And from there, I will know who to vote for. Okay, Abby, over to you. So my first question to you is, if elected, what would you do differently when it comes to COVID-19 safety and the guidelines and the passports differently from the other parties? Uh, so we've always said that the most important thing is information. We just want to know what to do. You know, we want to have clear information. We want to have consistent information. And because of that, we had been uh, encouraging the government all throughout the pandemic uh, to create uh, a panel uh, between levels of government that would create clear messaging that people could understand wherever they lived in the country. Um, and so that's something that we would have done. And that includes me. Mask on, mask off, who knows these days? So clear information and, and coordinating anything that we can coordinate, that's what I suggest. A follow-up, Abby? Okay. Why can't we find an alternative to a COVID passport? Because I feel like that's not the, it, it, that's not the answer. Where do we draw the line between our safety and our freedom and right as an individual. Yes, and just to say, uh, we haven't endorsed uh, a passport. We know that passports are important to have for things like international travel. It's going to become very difficult uh, to travel internationally without being able to prove that you've been vaccinated. I think that uh, we do need to have that discussion about people's, uh, about people's civil liberties. We know that we're going to have to, uh, and this is the time for us to, uh, to do that. Um, we should be talking about how we persuade communities who have had those difficult relationships about why this is so important, and we haven't done enough of that education okay. so far. Abby, I'm going to jump in now. So is it that you are concerned that this is, um, th that there are marginalized groups who are not being uh, thought of when it comes to vaccine passports, or do you not like the idea at all? Um, what we say is that anyone who can get vaccinated, we really encourage them to sure. do so, uh, but we recognize there are some that won't. And we, I do not believe that we should be forcing anyone to get vaccinated. Right. Um, no one's being forced to get vaccinated, but they are yeah. being told if you want to do mm -hmm. certain things in life, mm -hmm. you're going to have to mm -hmm. uh, have proof of vaccination. Mm -hmm. are, are you in support of that? Does and, that make sense to you? Yes, and we do know that there are communities yeah. uh, that are concerned, that are hesitant, that have had yeah. that bad um, interaction with our public health system. Them. So are we, going to, are we going to create wedges between people in our society or are we going to educate? Uh, do, do you know if all your candidates are vaccinated? I don't know if they're all vaccinated, but certainly we have encouraged them all to do that. Have you talked to them about it? Like, are, are there some people that you, you know haven't been vaccinated and you've reached out to them to talk about why it's important? Have well, you... we have made it very clear to all of them. I mean, the same messages uh, that we've been giving to the public that this is our best tool in defeating the pandemic and that, of course, we need to model what we're asking others to do. Okay, let's move on to our next voter. Hi, my name is Marin Mealy. I'm a 20 year old with my education currently on hold because of COVID-19. I love spending time outdoors, making art, and I'm an avid political watcher. I'm very passionate about the climate crisis and ensuring that we are mobilizing towards a climate just future in an intersectional way. 
Currently, I'm an undecided voter because none of the federal parties have displayed to me that they are able to follow through on their campaign promises in the areas that are important to me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how um, parties are going to put systems in place and ensure that they have accountability for these issues and also making sure that they are addressing the climate crisis with the urgency that it demands. Okay, Marin, over to you. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. My question to you is that you're making these big promises on the climate during your campaign, um, but how do we ensure that they don't simply remain climate prom or campaign promises and are translated into concrete policy and legislation? Thank you so much for your question. When we've made promises and had a chance to follow through on them, we always have. Uh, in the case of Parliament, even with a small caucus in the last Parliament, we always uh, punch above our weight. And over the years, you can see how our climate ideas have made their way into uh, the mainstream of politics. We were talking about carbon pricing years and years before it happened. And so I would say to you that any Green that is elected uh, to Parliament is someone that you can count on, absolutely. We were very disappointed uh, with the Climate Accountability Act. Um, and in fact, and it was not easy to do because a lot of environmental and climate groups were supportive of it. It wasn't enough, it didn't go far enough, it didn't meet the same standards as other countries who have accountability acts. So even when it's tough, we will say uh, what needs to be done and then also propose action. Th thanks for those, Marin. I, I, I'll ask you, I'll ask a follow-up to that, and then I have a couple specific sort of policy questions. If if you, if a voter is in a riding without a green candidate because mm -hmm. you don't have candidates in all 330 yep. ridings, what are you advising them to do? How how should who should they vote for if yep. they don't have someone from your party? They should vote for the uh, the MP, the representative that they believe is going back to Ottawa to get to work with all of the other parties on the climate. This is not a partisan issue. Um, in the way that the pandemic uh, is not and was not a partisan issue. Sure, but, but the, the difference I guess there is everyone wanted the pandemic to end. Not everyone wants climate change to be fought at the same level, right? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I realize you may not say mm -hmm. endorse a party here, but some mm -hmm. people are further off from the goal than others. I think you need to look at the candidates in your riding and ask who is going to be my climate champion. Then you should be able to tell them that this is what my community sure. wants you to do and expect that they do it in Ottawa. Sure, but uh, you would also admit that there are some parties that are not going very quickly. Well, the People's Party seems to need a little more... Well, the uh, Conservative Party, too, is at 30%. <laughs> wouldn't even increase the targets. Well, right? and, you know, really, uh, Rosie, it's, a, it's the difference between the Liberals and the Conservatives is that the Conservatives are being honest that uh, what they're planning to do is not going to get us uh, past 30% greenhouse gas emissions reductions. The Liberals are pretending that it's going to get us to um, net zero by 2050 when they know full well that it won't. There is no way for us to continue doing the things that they're planning to continue to do and to reduce greenhouse gases even by 30 percent. I want to ask you though about your plan. 60 percent mm -hmm. cut below 2005 levels. Um, you would have to, in your plan, you say increase carbon taxes by 25 bucks per ton each year starting in 2022 up until 2030. What, all that money that you're collecting then, does that go back to Canadians the Absolutely. way it does now? Okay. Absolutely. It's, it's intended to be revenue neutral. Okay. And so the idea is it comes in and it goes back out. That, that's still a huge increase. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lot of money for families to put out up front. Mm -hmm. How do regular families adjust to such an aggressive uh, carbon pricing plan? Well, again, it is neutral and you can design it in a way so that the money you can estimate the money and uh, get the money to people up front and we want to make sure absolutely that it is um, not only revenue neutral but it's also something that isn't uh, difficult and a burden to people and at the same time we know the carbon pricing produces innovation which makes it usually not necessary to get to that kind of level. Um, Andrew Weaver is the former Green Party leader in uh, British Columbia. He not only has endorsed the Liberals plan but he's also campaigning with Mr. Trudeau. What does that tell people who support Greens? That I guess he supports the Liberal Party in this election. I mean, he's, you know, with all due respect uh, to Andrew, and I do respect him very much, and I appreciate the support that he's offered me, I just think that he's wrong. And not do only do I think that he's wrong, Environment Canada has said very clearly that even if we do everything that the Liberals are proposing, we're not going to get um, to the 40% target. When we come back, more face-to-face -face on The National. What do you say to people who say that's too fast mm -hmm. and it's too reckless mm -hmm. that you don't care enough about economic growth?
Welcome back to Face to Face. Let's get to the next questioner. My name is Alexandre Carré. I'm 36 years old. I work in the video game industry. I am a music uh, geek. I was born in Montreal. Um, I was raised in poverty. The issues that I care about are social equality, uh, a good pandemic response, and a greener economy. Um, the, the reason why I, I vote for these types of issues is that uh, I, I've, I was able to rise from poverty. I would like to um, have everyone to have the equal opportunities that I've had. Okay, Alex, off you go. Uh, my question is, um, your platform states that the Green Party uh, plans to replace every fossil fuel job with high paying green sector jobs. Um, could you describe the process and how long would that take to get there? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we know from the experience of, of, of countries uh, that have gone further faster than we have in the transition, that the jobs uh, that are created in the green sector, uh, that they are very transferable, that the kind of skills you get working out in the oil patch are the kind of skills that you need uh, to be um, a worker in renewable energies, for instance. And the jobs pay more. They usually pay mm -hmm. um, between 5 and 10% more. Uh, they're safer. So we're talking about energy in Canada. Absolutely, we should be an energy superpower, but it should be renewable energy. And those energy workers in one field, they can be transferred immediately, immediately into those jobs without big retraining programs. Thank you for that, Tenemi. Um, I do have a follow-up question, though. Uh, nearly half of Canadians, uh, according to an Ipsos uh, survey study, that uh, don't think that environmentalism is a top priority issue. Uh, my question is, if you ever get elected, if you do, um, how will you be, be able to convince them more and more, I, I'm old enough, I'm in my late 40s, so I'm old enough to remember a time when we were talking about whether uh, climate change was real and whether global warming was a real thing. And most people in Canada, overwhelmingly, even in the regions, again, where people like to think that, uh, that there's a, you know, a difference of opinion, uh, they believe it. And they also believe that there isn't any choice that we have to make between the economy and the environment. I mean, these are just facts, and we should be able to speak with one voice. And I think if we can, then that is the last missing link that gets those, um, those last few people uh, where we need them to be. What will be your first action once you get elected? Really, the thing that I believe is going to make the biggest difference um, is committing uh, to work to change the culture in Ottawa. Uh, we have let partisanship get in the way of true action on the climate, uh, where it has become a political football when we should be working together. Okay, Alex, I'll, I'll go with a couple. We are yeah. now in an election where everyone has committed to some sort of carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. That's different than even two exactly. years ago. Yep. What does that tell you about uh, that, that shift in yeah. terms of how easy it would be to get the politic I mean, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Being, oh, having no. been around a long time, I'm sorry oh, to tell no. you. But in terms of what that conversation <laughs> yeah. would be if it wasn't yeah. uh, as big a wedge yeah. as it has been in the past. Um, first, you're right. We have come a long way, a long way. And, uh, you know, I, I give our party um, credit for that, not full credit. Uh, you know, there are many people in civil society who have worked a really long time to get us this far. Um, we still have further to go and not as much time. There are many people that didn't believe that even in the face of a pandemic, given how uh, divisive a politics had become, how polarized politics had become, that we would ever be able to unify that quickly to release so many resources for people to really turn on, 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 you know, on a dime the way that we did. We've got to be able to do that when it counts again. And I believe that the climate is one of those issues. So I remain hopeful and optimistic that we can do it. Uh, you, you know, you, you want to move more aggressively than everyone else, and you say it can happen. What do you say to people who say that's too fast mm -hmm. and it's too reckless mm -hmm. that you don't care enough about economic growth? We need to look at all the other major economies that are making this a priority, and we can't possibly tell ourselves that they've all decided collectively that they're going to ruin their economies. At a time when we are trying to pull our way out of a pandemic recession, for some people that might be a legitimate question. Yeah. That's too much right now. Yeah. Well, well, two things. First, you know, our climate uh, uh, plan 
it is absolutely in line uh, in terms of targets, in terms of speed uh, with our international partners. If we use our stimulus money to uh, accelerate our transition to net zero, yep. the kind of jobs that it will create, the kind of infrastructure and innovation is the thing that will set us up for the future. You, you see that some people think that's just, a, that's just a bit too fast. Well, again, it's the pace that our, um, our international partners have set for themselves. It's the pace that the United Nations has said that we need uh, to, to take. Time for a quick break, but up next. My question is, what can you say to convince me to trust the Green Party and give you my vote when it seems that the party members themselves are not getting along? Welcome back to Face to Face. Let's get to the next questioner. Hi, my name is Jennifer Grule. I live in Ottawa, Ontario. I'm a UBC kinesiology graduate, former rugby player, and a pet parent. I love the outdoors, gardening, and taking my dog for long walks on the river pathway. The climate emergency is the number one issue for me. I believe that every issue, including affordable housing, health care, child care, labor shortages, these need to be tied to the underlying climate emergency because at the end of the day, none of these issues will matter when our houses, hospitals, schools, and jobs are on fire or underwater. I'm an undecided voter because I'm not sure the current leaders really understand this issue. Okay, Jennifer, off you go with Ms. Paul there. So my question is, what can you say to convince me to trust the Green Party and give you my vote when it seems that the party members themselves are not getting along? Thank you for the question. And, and you're, you're right, there has been a lot of turmo turmoil. There has been a lack of unity. Uh, so I'm very sorry for that. And uh, I, I really wish that it, ha it were otherwise. What I would say, though, is that, uh, you know, Greens share a set of core values. And certainly right at the top uh, is the climate. That's something that's never going to change. Uh, and so anyone who is in a riding where we have a green running can feel confident that they're sending someone to Ottawa that is always going to make that a priority. So if, for example, like if the entire party doesn't, doesn't have to get vaccinated and then you have sides splitting, you know, one side says get vaccinated, one side get, doesn't, how can you bring that together and still put climate up top? You know, our parliament was designed in a way so that MPs uh, were supposed to be able to have those disagreements. So this isn't something that we should be afraid of. As long as we can meet and speak civilly with each other uh, and respectfully, we might actually learn something from disagreeing with each other. Jennifer, I'm gonna uh, do a couple follow-ups. I, I guess people don't really understand what happened. Mm -hmm. um, is it that people inside your party didn't like you? Is it, like, what, what happened there, and is it resolved? I mean, it's not just one thing. We had a leadership race, and after many years, I was elected with a particular mandate, um, which is one that is important, but can sometimes be uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, I, I can't say when people like me are elected to roles like this, because I'm one of only a couple people like myself to be elected to sure. a role like this, but. To get to this place, we had, I have demonstrated leadership in many other, many other uh, foras. Right. And so, uh, you know, we can't start saying that systemic things only stop applying when you become the leader right. of parties. So right. it's very difficult. I know that it's disappointing to many people who are prioritizing the climate. Um, but what I do know is that, again, when we have, when the, the chips are on the table, when we've had the opportunity to make a difference on the climate, we have always done that. So I'm just confused as to how we could allow just some parties, members of parliament, not want to get the vaccine, but also be leaders. Um, you know, in terms of vaccines, uh, again, they're, they're, they're lifesavers, and they have been for a long time, and it's absolutely a critical part of, of defeating this particular pandemic. This is the, the nuanced part of politics, though. You know, we have communities, we have Indigenous communities, we have religious communities, we have racial, uh, racialized um, communities as well, who have had terrible relationships with the healthcare system. We have to educate people. Uh, and then I believe that really most of that will resolve itself. 
Okay, I'm going to do a couple more questions, Jennifer. I hope that I hope that helped you. You you have said during this campaign that you didn't go to some ridings because you wanted to make sure that you would help people and not hurt people. Mm -hmm. Do you think you are a liability in some places in the country? And and what did you mean by that? I think because of what has happened, uh, that absolutely um, I could be a distraction. And I I want to make sure that anything I do helps and 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 doesn't harm. You know, one of the reasons that I'm here is that the election came when it did, and. I don't feel we should have had it, but it did. And I wanted uh, the party to have a leader going into this election. I wanted our candidates to have their very best shot. And since I'm here for that, I want to make sure I'm not doing anything to uh, to hurt them. Okay, so does that mean if you don't win your seat, you, you will no longer be leader? I'm going to think about that after, uh, the, after the 20th. Uh, I personally have found that there's no way to get through this except to focus on doing all that you can to um, support your candidates and to win yourself and going into this election leader leaderless uh, would have been a terrible disservice. I, 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 I take your point but yeah. I, I, it's pretty rare to have an election campaign where there's a leader who is even thinking about leaving her job mm -hmm. like and is trying to tell herself I'm not going to do it I'm going to stay for the good of the party and the mm -hmm. candidates. What what does that say? Well it says that uh, again you know we were um, we uh, entered this election not as far down the road as I would have liked. Um, we entered it weakened. And you're right, this is an extraordinary set of circumstances. Um, you know, we also have the complicating factor of the uh, pandemic as well. Um, I've been a leader only within the context of the yeah. pandemic. So there's a lot of exceptional things going on here. Face to Face with Annamie Paul continues right after this. Do you now, though, feel a little disillusioned that this so-called political family of yours has not maybe lived up to what you wanted if you're already thinking that you don't want to be the leader of the family anymore. Would you ever consider running for another party? I have never been a member of another party. The Green Party is the only uh, political family that I have ever had well, in politics. Okay. Do, but yeah. do you now, though, feel a little disillusioned that this so-called political family of yours has not maybe lived up to what you wanted if you're already thinking that you don't want to be the leader of the family anymore? Well, some of the, uh, some of the very best moments of my life and some of the very best people that I've ever met in my life uh, I've met through the Green Party. I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly grateful for that. Um, this has been, again, a very difficult period. And um, more than anything, as I said, I want people to really focus on the extraordinary candidates that we're running. Um, we are presenting people who would bring a different culture to Ottawa. Our candidates deserve every chance to be considered by, um, by the voters. H have you done any campaign events with Elizabeth May? Do you speak to Elizabeth May? I haven't been out to BC at all. I've been kind of leaning heavily on the BC case on, um, uh, with Elizabeth and Paul because they're out there. Right. Uh, they're on the ground. So they're definitely shouldering a lot of the uh, the BC right. campaigning in this election and, and your decision to primarily uh, campaign within your riding in Toronto mm -hmm. Centre for your own seat do you mm -hmm. still believe that that was the right thing to do uh, I feel that the right thing to do uh, was to meet the voters that ultimately are going to vote for me to be yep. their representative yep. and uh, and give them that respect. I have to earn their vote. L I'll just end on, on the issue of strategic voting. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those Canadians who, who really think that strategic voting is something they really have to think about, particularly because yeah. the race is so tight? Yeah. People, when they're voting, they need to ask themselves, are we sending back people who are going to give us more of the same, who are going to lead us down the same road that we've been going down for all of these years, where we haven't had action on all of these things that we've been, I've been asked about uh, today, or are we going to send some new voices there? Okay. Um, people are tired of the culture of Ottawa. That means electing some new people if you're tired of it. Okay. And then I guess the last thing I would say is, again, um, Greens prove their worth whenever they're elected. Okay, Ms. Paul, thank you for making the time from the thank campaign. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, that is our final thank night of our face-to-face -face series. We hope it helps all of you make an informed choice if you haven't already. We want to thank our virtual audience members watching this live with us. And of course, all those smart questioners uh, who hopefully this helped them. And of course, Annami Paul and all the other party leaders for making time for us during this last busy week. If you missed any of our conversations, you can find them on the CBC News app and on CBC Gem. I'm Rosemary Barton. Good night. I'll see you back here for election night, though probably a few times before too. Bye-bye.